Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of Patreon AMA sessions. Moving on today in this September through October 2021 edition, a continued discussion with the members of the School for Bintex. Remember, you can join us there. As little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So, of course, I apologize that this AMA session has been delayed um, multiple times because um, we're covering the September session now in like November 7th, uh, because in early October, you might recall, uh, we were trying to finish that Hegel Phenomenology of Spirit group reading before that strict October 8th deadline when I had to present at an academic conference here in India, and of course, trying to finish one of the most difficult books ever written, perhaps we can venture to say that as far as actually making you think uh, goes, it's one of the most difficult books. Um, we're trying to finish it in an incredibly short amount of time, um, considering that even like the best students of philosophy, um, that I had met when I was in academia, they, they would typically spend like an entire year reading that book. Well, we did the whole thing within just a few months, um, and we didn't just passively read the words on the page either. Um, I, we were doing a detailed paragraph by paragraph analysis, um, actually putting together all of the notes to um, to make the Hegel videos is one of the most time-consuming things I've done in my entire life. So in early October, it simply was not possible to set aside one day for any other task. So I bumped this ahead to early November, and then unexpectedly, I got sick with the flu. And it was a particularly nasty um, strain of uh, influenza, um, possibly due to the, uh, the monsoon season being extended, making it colder. Who knows what the reason was, but it, trust me, it was pretty nasty. So um, even though I had... Uh, just barely enough strength uh, two days ago to do the Missing Link Pico News show. Uh, yesterday, I was back to being just completely incapable of doing any work. And today's the first day I'm feeling mostly normal. Well, not quite 100%, but um, this is the first time I felt um, well enough to uh, be able to uh, answer very difficult questions. Because let's keep in mind that uh, the AMA sessions are kind of the most difficult, but also, you know, the, the most uh, enjoyable uh, thing that we get to do on this channel. Because um, these are real questions rather than the kind of pseudo questions you get um, within the so-called educational system within the West, like when you're um, in the uh, public um, high school, public middle school, public elementary school system, at least where I'm from, I remember um, they were mostly just um, teaching you how to uh, take open book tests. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that if um, they're spending the whole year teaching how to take uh, standardized tests like CSAP, um, just to get more funding for the school. Uh, they're basically just trying to see if you're intelligent enough to um, notice that the answer is on page 5 and then bubble it in on page 10. And of course, even that is still too difficult for many people within the American educational system, but that is precisely because that's not real education. You never actually learn how to think in the process of doing that. Um, but with the AMA sessions, the, this is, these are real questions which re require real thinking. And that is why I wanted to be uh, fully healed before I got into it. And I thank everybody who has some of these questions. And remind you, you can um, once again join us at the School Forbidden Texts or just the price of one cup of coffee. Submit your own questions, participate, discuss with the other members of the school, etc. So we'll move on to the first question, which um, I'll just tell you from the start. I'm not going to be able to provide the full answer for it right now because um, it's Moby Dick is just such a long book that um, as I was uh, trying to uh, think about this um, in preparation for the AMA session, um, I realized I had to just go back through the whole text, and I took a, a fresh notebook, and I was like annotating uh, page numbers, quotes, um, observations, uh, 60 pages worth in this notebook, and I only got halfway through the book, uh, and then uh, out of nowhere I got sick. But I'll go ahead and um, share those notes tomorrow, hopefully in a video, um, where I kind of provide a, a walkthrough of, of Moby Dick with my own thoughts. Um, not just summarizing, obviously, but trying to uh, show the connections, the, um, the references, etc., how these tie together, the philosophical implications of all of this. Um, I'll, I'll try to share that tomorrow because I think it'll be necessary to see all of that stuff before you can write an answer to the question of, um, as the patron says, um, why Ishmael, despite claiming himself to be a devout Christian, always shows such a high tolerance of paganism and even makes it seem in this particular section, um, the uh, patron shared a screenshot of uh, a passage from fairly early on in the book, which I will, of course, um, show you um, in, in, in much better detail um, when I provide the full answer. Um, in this particular section, okay, to return to the patron's question, like 
he, meaning Ishmael, does not actually take any religion to be absolutely true. I notice it's just the fate of becoming a modern human, but still at, this, at the time that this book was written, it was not that common, I guess, in America to hold views as controversial as Melville apparently did. And still, if something of this kind is present in the book, then I imagine it must have a very strong significance. Well, you're absolutely right that it has a strong significance. So much so, in fact, that, um, you know, once again, I'm going to have to provide the full answer to this in a video of its own, and that is simply because Moby Dick is so long. And also because Melville was uh, so very careful with the way that he worded the particular passages of this text, I think um, you have to acknowledge so many of those fine details um, to begin to uh, address something as important as this. So um, I really uh, will just have to answer this in another um, video after I just go through that walkthrough of the first half of the text um, as I share these uh, 60 pages worth of notes which I took before I ended up getting sick. So thank you for this question. I really look forward to um, having the full discussion of it in a video, another video very soon. So, so the next question is over the problem of IQ or intelligence quotient. The question from the patron reads, I don't think it really matters much since you're obviously smart, but I was just wondering if you ever have taken an IQ test, Chad Haig. My own guess is that you're above 130 and likely north of 140. Well, thank you for that um, question and also for that estimate. Um, I will say that I have taken an IQ test. It was just not an official IQ test. And when you hear the details of how this worked out, you very well might call into question whether it deserves to be called an IQ test at all. But it literally was promoted as one in the um, Denver Post newspaper or some other newspaper, I forget, um, back when I was in high school. So the story goes that when I was in psychology class in 2004, back when I was in 10th grade, nearly 20 years ago, um, one morning the teacher showed up with a uh, cutout from a newspaper article from some time that claimed to provide um, a free IQ test for anyone reading it um, to just take on their own and see what their IQ is. So the test um, consisted of 10 questions, um, only one of which was very, you know, obvious, very easy in the answer, and the other nine were much more challenging. So we just took this all together and kept uh, track of our, our scores. And if I recall correctly, um, in this room of like 20 students or whatever, um, all of us got only one question right out of 10, and it was just that very easy obvious answer. So on the basis of that, the psychology teacher concluded that we all had the same IQ, which was 100. We were all of perfectly average intelligence. So that's quite interesting with all the diversity, whatever, um, in a room of 20 different students, we all have exactly the same IQ and it's perfectly average. And we know this because out of 10 questions, we were only able to answer the most obvious one. At the age of 15 years old, at a time when, you know, our own education up to that point had mostly consisted of just filling in, you know, bubbles on standardized tests and other nonsense like that. Um, but be that as it may, if you uh, believe the results of this um, newspaper-based IQ test, I have an IQ of 100. I am perfectly average in my intelligence. <laughs> now, obviously, I don't know what my real IQ is because I've never had it formally tested, and I don't think I ever will. The interesting thing about having your IQ formally evaluated is I know various people who have had that done, and they all tell me that their IQ result came back very high, but it's interesting that none of them will ever say what the number actually is. I've noticed this. Maybe you've noticed this yourself with very various other people who have who have um, similarly told you, you know, that they had their IQ evaluated. They'll always say, oh, it's much higher than you'd think, but they'll never tell you what it actually is. To which I say, then what's the point of actually doing it? It seems like one of those secrets which you can't actually tell anybody. Um, so the idea of, um, of IQ being a meaningful measure of how intelligent a person is, is something I'd like to maybe challenge by asking what kind of intelligence are they measuring? It seems to me that much of what the IQ test is looking for is just how useful you might be to the global technological system. We know this because Ted Kaczynski was praised by the media as having a high IQ and doing very um, impressive or brilliant uh, or intelligent 
uh, work when he was still in the academic industry, but that's only because the kind of work he was doing there was um, stuff that's held promise to be useful for the global technological system. Okay, um, It's interesting that after he left academia and stopped doing pure mathematics, he was still doing um, very uh, impressive intellectual work. After all, he wrote a number of, you know, uh, texts like Industrial Society and its Future, and then after he went to prison, he wrote um, Anti-Tech Revolution, Why and How, and these are um, not, you know, um, just his uh, personal unfounded opinions on things. They're fully rational uh, meditations um, on the possible and impossible objects of not just a purely abstract variety as you would do in mathematics, but of a political and social variety, which is arguably even more difficult to understand. He's literally making predictions for the long-term trends of history, the most important of those predictions being the impossibility of the global technological system continuing to advance forever without self-destructing at some point. The trouble is that at that point, um, we might also self-destruct with it. So he's doing something which, you know, the supposedly highest IQs in the world are um, either also doing but making much less, uh, you know, valid predictions or they're refusing to do it at all because they're simply, they say that's above my pay grade, right? So why is it that only the work he did before he was, um, before he left academia is recognized by the media as brilliant and everything after that is simply written off as madness, okay? It's the same guy, it's the same methodology, which is rationality, right? But because the first one is use, seemed to be potentially useful to the global technological system, it is recognized, um, whereas all the other stuff is just um, written off as mental illness, okay? And that is one of the reasons why I hesitate to go all in with believing this IQ um, believing in the methodology, I should say, of how IQ is um, uh, evaluated um, or measured by the psychological professionals as I can understand it. And I also have questions about um, IQ because of the way that every so often you'll see another viral article come out online um, claiming to restore the IQ of so many dead figures from the past on the basis, apparently, just of looking at the writings that they left behind. For example, there was uh, one, you know, website that claimed that Immanuel Kant, you know, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, author of The Critique of Pure Reason and other very difficult texts um, that are very original, you know, um, he was uh, not just uh, becoming an expert on other people's opinions, he was creating his own philosophy, which is one of the most difficult things, and influence the trajectory of world history after his death continues to influence us. They still only gave him about 150-something IQ, uh, if I remember correctly, maybe like 159 or something like that. Okay, so close to 160, but not quite. Um, which is, of course, still very high, but uh, then this same ranking gave Voltaire something like a 200 IQ. Um, now let's think about that for just a moment. Um, Voltaire um, is largely a satirist who wrote these funny stories mocking religion in 18th century France. And don't get me wrong, I read Candide in French when I was in college, and it was a fun book, but um, it was not the best book I've ever written, um, and I never reread it again after I finished that class. And by the way, Many of the people who read Condit are not even in college, they're high school kids. It's like an, it's a classic text to read in AP French if you have a high school that offers that. Mine did not offer AP anything, but if you go to a wealthy high school where they have AP, you'll probably read Condit. And I know that because various people I met in college said, oh, I already read this when I was in high school. So it's interesting that a short satirical book mocking religion from 18th century France is, you know, literally considered the greatest accomplishment in the history of mankind. Voltaire was at the very top of this list of um, dead figures with an IQ of like 200 just because he was making fun of religion. Like, that's the kind of biases which these, you know, disinterested evaluators bring to the table is, well, obviously Voltaire was smarter than Kant because there's still some room for, for God in Kant's um, system, however debatable that might be. So, therefore, obviously the, um, the avowed atheist is smarter simply because he's gone beyond such illusions. This is the reason, among others, why I find the very notion of IQ 
as it is currently, you know, put forth by people like this anyway, to be somewhat suspect because there's all these other presuppositions that sneak in. Another reason I find IQ to be problematic is that um, many people who have exceptional ability to be useful for the global technological system um, have certain um, deficiencies in other areas of their thinking. A great example of this is Ted Kaczynski mentions that people um, uh, with fairly impressive technical skills tend to be very naive on political issues. What better example of that than, um, you know, uh, Bill Joy, I think, who wrote a response to the Unabomber you know, Manifesto um, shortly after Kaczynski's arrest saying, yeah, he makes a lot of valid points, but uh, the solution's really not that hard. We just need to be more loving. That's the kind of non-response, I think, which only evidences that he completely missed the point. He actually did not understand all of the um, criticisms which Kaczynski was raising regarding technology because saying all you have to do is be more loving misses the point that it is not humans' misuse of technology which calls into question the future of complex life on Earth. It is the technology itself. And anyone, quite frankly, with a very basic comprehension of that text when they read it will understand that distinction. Um, this guy who made a lot of money in the technological industry, obviously very competent in that area, still missed so basic a point as that. It's kind of like the stereotype, as offensive as this might be to some, of having a friend or a family member who's um, an engineer that you try to come to them with a, a personal problem, and you talk for a while, and then you just hear an awkward silence on the other end, and then they kind of sigh and they say something very, very simplistic in response like, well, I don't know, I guess you just have to try harder. Right. Um, or, well, I don't know, maybe you just need to look for some better options. And that's all they have to say. Once again, no offense, it is a stereotype, but that's exactly what Bill Joy is doing. You know, you have this very long critique of technology in the Unabomber Manifesto, which he ended up, he admittedly read the whole thing. And then he had an awkward silence afterwards. He sighed and he said, well, we just need to be more loving. That's all. And, you know, the IQ test will probably show a guy like that having a very high IQ just because he has skills which are useful to the global technological system. But the kind of real thinking demanded by, say, the Unabomber Manifesto, I'm sorry, it's just beyond the scope of someone like like Bill Joy or Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil is another one who, um, you know, responded to the Unabomber Manifesto um, with the uh, some passage in one of his books I forget the name of because I haven't actually read um, much of Ray Kurzweil, mostly just short essays, as you saw in my critique of him in the sixth book. I haven't, in other words, I haven't actually wasted like the 20 bucks or whatever to order one of his sprawling books that just tell us um, largely in empirical details all of the advancements that have happened already and why that proves more are inevitable. Um, I simply don't have the time to waste on such nonsense, but um, Kurzweil's response really is about the same. You know, he has a long pause he sighs and then he says, well, it's not that big a deal because, you know, ultimately the machines are still going to give us what we want. And we know that because they've already given us what we want and we can extrapolate from past trends what the future will be. They've already let us be better consumers, so why wouldn't they let us be better consumers in the future? So, once again, the IQ test will probably show somebody like Kurzweil as being really high up on the list, but he's still totally incapable of really thinking about something as basic as, you know, whether the expectation that machines will always serve humans, which is what, you know, the consumer model uh, presupposes, by the way, um, whether that might be called into question for reasons that are properly philosophical, okay? Um, the idea of whether self-propagating systems have no um, no need to presuppose the existence of humans because there's these sort of rationalized essences that function perfectly well with viruses as they do with robots, neither of which um, have any element of life. Well, someone like Kurzweil either doesn't, uh, either um, pretends to not understand that because he'd rather, you know, keep te keep making money off telling people what they want to hear, or it's just not the kind of thinking that he's used to because this is, you know, real thinking, real philosophical thinking, divergent thinking, questioning phil philosophical presuppositions, and I don't know how much such divergent thinking is measured by the IQ test. I think it's pretty good at measuring your ability for linear thinking, building one result on top of another, which is the kind of thinking useful for science and things like that. Um, but I don't know if it really measures 
or whether it really can measure the kind of divergent thinking, which, by the way, um, sets, I think, the tiny minority of really original thinkers in history from the uh, much larger mi minority of people within the population who can do something useful for the global technological system, okay? So, I mean, the number of people who could write Don Quixote is so small as to basically be just one guy. It was just Cervantes. <laughs> Nobody else could have written Don Quixote except Cervantes. How do you measure that with an IQ test? You can't. What you can measure with an IQ test is how um, intellectually capable somebody is of, say, uh, majoring in physics at a major institution, which, by the way, is not hard. I'm, I, excuse me, is not easy. <laughs> I am not making light of how difficult that is, but that's something which can be measured with the IQ test, perhaps, but um, is, is not the same as measuring the once in the history of mankind type of person which Cervantes was, okay? And I'm I'm not completely skeptical of the very idea of there being differences in intelligence for people. You know, I'm not giving the uh, politically correct idea of, oh, we're, we're all just exactly the same. Obviously, we're not. I just don't know how much you could use something which is inherently technological at the end of the day, like an IQ test, um, to scan for... Um, you know, certain differences, which I think are most meaningful when they're not technological. So uh, the accomplishments of Cervantes are most meaningful because they're not technology. This is real purified art. Okay, um, the kind of thinking of, say, Aristotle um, is, um, is not technological either because this is pure meditation. He's not trying to solve problems or engineer machinery to do certain jobs. He's simply um, contemplating uh, the deepest truths, okay? It's not technology, so how can it be measured by a technology of evaluating people's IQs, okay? So this is the difficulty of trying to um, turn this back on myself as well, is, you know, have I done things in my life intellectually that are very difficult, like, say, writing a book? If I were to rank the things that I've done intellectually um, from, you know, hardest to easiest, well, writing a book is, you know, definitely, like, right up there is the very hardest, okay? Um, it takes a lot more um, intellectual energy to write a book than to read a book, okay? Let alone to just, you know, be able to pass a handful of bullshit classes on a college campus or in a high school, okay? So the accomplishments, if you can call them that, um, which I've done, which have been the most intellectually demanding, as I know subjectively, does the IQ test really um, have any way to measure that? I don't know that it does. I mean, I'm sure that uh, many people listening right now know much more about this than I do as somebody who's never actually been officially tested. Um, but I'm still skeptical of the idea that measuring somebody's usefulness to the technological system is the same as measuring how intelligent, gifted, whatever they actually are. I think you really kind of got to know somebody to measure that. You have to know them on a personal level, see them, you know, at, at work and thinking and discussing and actually um, finding, um, you know, ways to uh, challenge the status quo in a more meaningful way than, of course, the stupid SJW sort of caricature. Um, it, it really takes stuff like that to see how intelligent a person actually is, and I don't know that it can be measured. But at any rate, thank you, thanks a lot for the, this question. It was very interesting to think about. And I will now move on to the next one, which is from a fellow vlogger who also uh, makes videos on philosophy and was asking... Um, how to go about doing so. The question is, I was wondering if you could make a video on or address in the AMA the way that you research and create your lectures. Like, how do you efficiently take notes as you're reading and then take these notes and make them into presentable lecture material? You seem rather efficient at this, but I've been struggling with it a bit. So, um, to order, uh, in, in order to answer this question, um, excuse me, I would have to really go back all the way to the very beginning and sort of show you how I um, developed this skill over many years. So in um, fall 2011, a full 10 years ago, um, almost who knows to the day, it was like November 2011, I recall, um, I started my first YouTube channel um, on philosophy, which was actually, um, I think, called the Anime Lit Theorist. So most people would be surprised to know that at that very early phase, I had originally wanted to start a channel where I, an um, I analyze uh, anime shows, like, uh, say, Gundam Wing, 
or uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Rurouni Kenshin, Inuyasha, shows like that, Dragon Ball Z, um, but with, uh, you know, literary theory, um, you know, uh, literary theory figures applied to them like Freud or Derrida or Foucault. Now, I never actually got around to doing the analysis of the anime, uh, but I still tried to talk about some of the theorists, and virtually nobody watched. Um, I think the only subscriber I ever had on that channel, the only viewer, was uh, a guy named Ape Kill Snake, which uh, had has kind of uh, disappeared from the internet as, as far as I can see, um, although many of you probably remember who that is, uh, but at any rate, um, I remember um, at that time the videos did not get very many views largely because they weren't very good. I'll just be the first one to admit that um, at that very early phase of making videos, my own methodology was largely to just try to remember off the top of my head, what I had learned when I was an undergrad, um, you know, in some cases like years earlier, and then just make the video from memory. And, you know, once again, it was not very good because um, I realized soon afterwards that um, to be able to talk about these things, you have to at least reread the text. At that time, quite frankly, I was maybe so lazy or whatever that I wasn't, I didn't feel the need to go back and reread this whole text that I had read in undergrad. I just tried to go back on memory. And by the way, this is YouTube. We don't need that much information. Just a few minutes briefly synopsizing what Derry Dow or, what, or whoever said on this or that topic. Um, by 2012, I realized instead that you should read the text and then make the video afterwards with all that information in mind, but I still wasn't really taking notes, except maybe a jotting down you know, things on, on the margins a little bit here and there. I certainly did not have, say, a whole notebook set aside to write detailed notes and then make the videos um, from those. So in 2012, when I uh, started the, ch uh, the second channel, Chad African, I instead would, um, once again, read the text, and then I would uh, try to uh, do the video, but once again, uh, from memory, I would just speak to the camera um, without, you know, any, you know, slides or anything like that, um, and I would uh, try to have the whole argument inside my head before I began, and an example of this I actually shared a few months ago. It's called like rare 2014 footage. You can see in that video what this looks like having the whole 20 something minute argument about synopsizing chapter two of Slavoj Zizek's for they know not what they do in my head before I start speaking. And that was something which um, in a certain sense it was very useful to uh, get some practice with being able to speak about something without any notes in front of me, without having the slides and things like that. It was very useful, okay? But um, the quality of the videos I found could be improved upon through other methods, like, for example, um, eventually bringing those slides in, although that was not done until, I think, the very end of 2018. So even in um, summer 2018, when I first brought back the third channel of Chad Haig, um, at the very beginning, you could see me once again just talking to the camera, largely from memory. Sometimes I have, I have a, a notebook to, to check if I'm, um, um, you know, uh, addressing everything that, on a list that needs to be addressed, but I'm still basically speaking from memory about a text that I, I just read and is still fresh there in my mind, but of course, over time, that came to be, uh, I came to rely more and more on the slides. And um, first, I was basically just paraphrasing um, on the basis of very short snippets of what I saw on the screen. But later, I came to be more and more um, picky with regard to getting the words exactly right during the lecture. And this eventually took the form of just writing out the lecture beforehand, word for word, on the screen. As I still get criticism for the videos about a year ago, you'll notice all the words are right there on the screen and I would just read it. And, you know, that was a response to this very specific um, genealogy of how these videos had developed from, you know, once again, back in 2011, speaking purely from memory, from something I had not even read in the recent past, which was not very good, to, you know, uh, 2012, 13, and 14, where I was um, speaking uh, to the camera with no notes, just speaking from memory, the whole argument inside my head, inevitably things get left out, etc. Um, to eventually going to the other extreme about a year ago of 
um, you know, having the whole thing written out on the screen. So it's been a very long process of, um, you know, finding different ways to make these videos. I feel like in a lot of ways, some mix of all of those would be the ideal uh, moving forward now that I'm finally getting back into making these videos now that, uh, you know, the, the sickness is over, the conference is over, all of these other things. But I'd like feedback from the viewers also. What do you think works the best? Um, I think a, a kind of conversational approach, speaking to the camera is, all, is good, but, you know, finding some way to include all of the details of that argument would be as well. So the, the question is not just, of course, over how to make the videos, that's the first part. Um, the way that uh, one researches and uh, researches takes notes as one's reading and then turns these notes into presentable lecture material, that is something which I think the answer for is actually kind of mysterious. I think that um, you have to have a certain level of familiarity and comfort with the subject matter as you're reading the text, as you're making the notes, in order to have that same sort of comfort um, as you're speaking about it in the video. This is why I only talk really in this uh, channel about subjects that I'm fairly comfortable with. Now I'll read about other subjects um, too on my own free time um, that I don't make videos on because I acknowledge my own lack of um, comfort with regard to being able to just talk about them uh, without feeling like I'm simply restating what is literally there within the book. Okay, And that is something which I think, you know, is a skill which is very hard to teach. I think that the more philosophy you read, the more second nature it will be for you to just discuss philosophically, if that makes any sense. Um, when you're first, you know, coming to philosophy and reading a, a very difficult person like, say, Aristotle, as I read him for the first time um, in college back in 2009, at first all you're really able to do is restate exactly what the arguments are. Like in 2009, I could restate material cause is such and such, formal cause is such and such, efficient cause is such and such, but I'd basically just be repeating what the professor had said within class, and that's where I had to start. Over time, I was able to add a lot more input into the discussion of Aristotle simply because I'd become much more familiar, comfortable, etc., with the subject matter. And that is kind of a, a positive feedback loop where the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be with it. So there's really no, uh, no way to... Um, uh, to do that except through practice. So I think that uh, as far as, you know, making the notes as you go um, goes, you have to have that mindset as you're reading the text in order to have it show up at those later stages as well. And, you know, once again, this is something which you'll, you'll talk more like a philosopher the more you talk to other philosophers, the more you even just listen to philosophers by reading their entire books rather than just, you know, quite frankly, you know, uh, referencing this or that snippet on Wikipedia um, or whatever. So that is, I think, about as much as I can say on how I make these videos. Um, and I, I really hope that helps. And once again, I appreciate the question. So I'll go ahead and move on now to this next one over the topic of fiction. This was a question for all the patrons within the Discord. Um, and I will go ahead and just say you guys, because I'm from Colorado, okay, so it's just more natural for me to say that. Um, it is, I was wondering what you guys are interested in as far as fiction. I'm beginning to write fiction myself after years of depressed dormancy with a renewed focus on the philosophical detriment of technology, the modern age, etc. But I was wondering what are some of your favorite books or the kinds of writing which you would like to see more of, etc. So when it comes to recommending writers of fiction who are worth reading, let's just say for no pathological motivation whatsoever. That is to say, there are some writers who obviously people only read because they think it's going to advance their academic career. In fact, it's not hard to find these. All you have to do is go to college, pay $50,000 per year in student loans or tuition to uh, drain your parents' life savings, and you'll hear, you'll be forced to read, rather, a bunch of obscure writers that uh, you probably have never heard of before and you certainly will not find at the local bookstore because nobody would care enough to read these uh, folks unless uh, they're uh, simply trying to advance their academic career 
here and that usually is only for purely political purposes so there will be some obscure writer for representing some nation that um, the other academic careers have not cashed in on yet and then some careers will swoop in and um, claim to have discovered this writer for the first time and um, you know rise up to a higher salary while well, claiming to fight against the system of global capitalism what better way to fight against the system of global capitalism than to secure a higher paying position within it to buy more of the stupid shit produced by it well at any rate the logic of the um, a average academic careerist that um, the only reason why you should care about a given writer of fiction is whether you're going to get some monetary benefit from pretending to care about them uh, that's exactly what I think um, this question is not asking and for that reason I'm going to give you the exact opposite answer which is what are the sort of um, writers which you would read um, if you had no other maybe reason to do it except that you actually want to have a good time with that particular day and a great example of this is um, a very long uh, flight uh, especially um, the the longest flight I think you possibly can take on planet Earth is maybe from you know North America all the way to India okay maybe there are technically some other ones that are longer I guess if you were going all the way from South America that would be much longer because you'd have to have some sort of connecting flight from say Brazil to I don't know to uh, Miami Florida and and then from there to Europe so I, I'll grant that that's longer but um, in my own experience uh, flying from Denver Colorado all the way to India which I've done um, you know if you count the 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 trip there and the trip back I've done that five times in my life okay that's a pretty long two-day flight and if you have if you're flying with United quite frankly then it'll be more like four days with all the uh, canceled flights and other incompetencies on their part as I found out the hard way back in 2017 the first time I came to India trying to book the cheapest flight with you know who and learning the hard way that that is um, there, there are some things in life where it's well worth paying a little bit of extra if you could fly with somebody like like, say, um, Alaskan rather than United. But at any rate, um, if you're stuck on an airplane um, for, say, 10 hours at a time and then you're stuck in an airport for s so many more hours after that um, and you don't want to just waste it on your smartphone, um, having a book that is actually uh, worth reading, that is actually enjoyable to read, that is... Um, something the value of which cannot even really be estimated okay let's just say it's really high and the books that I always tended to bring with me when I was on flights like that um, was actually um, oftentimes uh, David Class okay David Class is a writer you have probably never heard of because of the particular genre of writing which he did which has a very sort of um, uh, very effective business model in the sense that writing for um, young teens and after all I discovered David Class myself when I was in eighth grade and there was a certain number of hours every month um, it wasn't I don't think it was every day but every month there were a certain number of hours that you had to spend um, in silent reading because in um, eighth grade language arts class you cannot simply lecture to those kids on grammar the entire time you're in school eight hours a day well about a fourth of that every day i think is spent in language arts class if i'm not mistaken um so you know a certain amount of that time they would uh just have silence in the room and you would have to read a book from the collection within the classroom itself which was of course uh selected from uh, a certain catalog I guess that was marketed to them specifically for that age group also kind of uh, very subtly for political purposes so David Class is also an environmentalist who I do critique by name in detail in say my fourth book hermeneutics of ecological limitation um, so not not exactly the kind of environmentalist that you know Penty Linkle is but still somebody who's um, legitimately concerned about things like deforestation and um, you know hunting uh, species to exist uh, out of existence um, hunting them to extinction etc um, and somebody who I think realized that the particular business model of writing to young adults in which case um, the customers are really libraries and middle schools and you know institutions like that right um, that open up a certain window of opportunity for him to ironically affect more people precisely because he didn't have to convince any of his readers to buy his book so he, he was in intelligent enough really to understand that if he wanted to influence enough kids at an age where they would be old enough to understand it 
and um, not yet set enough in their opinions that it would be hopeless to try to convince them to do this, he would have to basically speak to middle school kids. And this is actually the um, same thing which my own eighth grade history teacher said. I mean, people ask him, why do you teach middle school? Isn't that the worst age of all? And he said, no, this is the only age group I'm interested in teaching. I'm not settling for teaching middle school. This is where I want to be. And this is precisely because when you're younger than this, um, you can't understand the political issues I'm trying to explain to you. And when you're older than middle school, you've already made up your mind. Certainly by the time you reach, you know, adulthood, um, it, it's far too late. And um, this was coming from a guy, by the way, who was literally trying to um, teach us in the middle of uh, rural southern Colorado in the year like 2002, you know, right after the country was um, united behind Bush um, to invade Iraq. Um, as a result of 9-11, uh, um, a fairly, you know, conservative Republican whatever moment in the nation's history. He was there in the middle of rural southern Colorado trying to tell us why, uh, you know, communism really wasn't that bad. And by the way, everything you have to say about the Soviet Union and communist China and North Korea is irrelevant because that's not real communism. Real communism would be more like going all the way back to the Garden of Eden in economic terms. Um, that's a fairly controversial message to be pushing in that particular area you know, a very uh, <laughs> red county within, at that time it was a red state because we hadn't had quite as many people flee California and then turn Colorado into the same place. This was 20 years ago, keep in mind. Um, and he was only able to, I think, um, do that sort of really controversial um, uh, teaching in a public school, by the way, in um, a, a very uh, conservative um, rural village, uh, precisely because he was talking to middle school kids. And we did have a certain susceptibility to influence but the thing that um, he himself also uh, left out, which David Class got, was that um, to get kids of that age to really think about political issues, you ha also have to entertain them into it. You can't just, in David uh, Class's uh, case, hand them an ecology textbook that shows all of the numerical data for how much uh, deforestation is taking place, etc., um, and then use that, re rely on that alone to uh, get them to care about the thing like, like mass extinction. No, David Class realized, in addition to um, targeting you know middle school kids as um, still capable of being influenced on a sort of political issues, he, he realized you also have to do it through entertainment. And um, he really is, regardless of his political views, uh, one of the greatest entertainers um, that uh, I've seen within my lifetime. That is to say, somebody who actually lived and continues to live within um, within my lifetime. He's one of the best, easily within the top three, maybe higher than that. And it's interesting that um, virtually nobody has ever heard of him. And I also would not know of his existence if it weren't for having to read him basically when I was in eighth grade, because um, it was a requirement to spend a certain number of hours um, every month in silent reading, and that was uh, California Blue just happened to be one of the books in the room because it was the year 2002. I'm sure that that book eventually got discarded and replaced by something else because that's the business model which um, young adult fiction uh, follows. If you go to the um, that section of your local public library, for example, you'll find mostly just a bunch of books from the past few years. And I remember um, re uh, trying to uh, find more of David Class's works at the uh, local public library in, say, 2017 when I had this reawakening where I remembered him after many years and tried to find more of his work. Um, the only one that they had at the um, uh, Arvada Public Library, sub a suburb of Denver, Colorado, was um, a very recent book he'd written in 2015. And I'm sure they don't even have that anymore um, because the business model, once again, is to um, have this on the shelf for a few years and then discard it and I guess sell it on Amazon for like, you know, a dollar or something like that. That's actually, I've gotten um, most of his works. It was just a very cheap uh, copies when you open them it says discarded and then there's some you know library maybe from a, a high school somewhere in the country maybe a public library um, or some very rarely you might even find it like a, a college library but it's always some institution that bodies book so um, I will however still um, recommend that you uh, check him out 
And um, even if you don't agree with his politics, uh, you will find the stories very entertaining because he creates these characters who you feel, even if you know on a rational level that they don't exist, you still feel like they should. Like if I were to go to New Jersey right now, um, I would feel that somewhere there must be a high school exactly like the one in Losers Take All, and there must be some British guy in that high school who um, teaches part-time Latin and... Um, you know, uh, spends his free time uh, creating simulations of battles to see whether Livy's account or Polybius' account of Hannibal crossing the Alps is the more accurate one as determined by the computer model he created himself on his own free time. Um, I feel like that person should exist, even though I know rationally that he doesn't. Um, it's kind of a, a caricature of, uh, of of something kind of like various people. I'm sure that Davy Klassman in his life, I guess he, he studied history at Yale. That's why some of the weirder characters like that are into, you know, ancient Roman history and, you know, uh, they uh, speak Latin and things like that. He probably had some weird professors at Yale years ago who were kind of like this guy. But, of course, um, the uh, portrayal is so convincing that I, I still feel like if I went there, there must be somebody in New Jersey just like that, right? Um, and this is a, a, a writer which I always go out of my way to try to recommend to people because um, his... Uh, business model, once again, of getting um, his texts out to really the maximum number of kids who did not have to buy it, that is to say they did not have to, at the age of 13, beg their parents for, say, 20 bucks to get this at the bookstore brand new, fresh from the printing press, um, but instead um, were basically given the opportunity to read it for free by basically being required to do so um, as part of quiet reading time. He realized that this business model um, exposed him to more readers than would have been the case otherwise, but the downside to that is that that that's only for the few years that it's still current enough to sit on the the uh, library shelf or the uh, classroom shelf. So that's why I go out of my way to try to recommend him at a time when I believe all of his works except one, the most recent one, um, are out of print now. And some of them are incredibly difficult to find. But um, if you can read California Blue, um, Losers Take All, um, Night of the Tiger, that's an extremely rare book he wrote in the late 1980s. Um, about a serial killer who um, stalks girls in Yale uh, University Library and murders them while they're studying. It's kind of um, a variation on the, uh, you know, the urban myths about um, uh, people who cause mischief within the Yale Library, which um, actually do um, have some basis in truth. Like there was one professor at Yale who uh, teaches the Don Quixote course here. Um, on YouTube. They have, uh, they just recorded all of his lectures at Yale, and he said when he was a graduate student at Yale himself decades ago, there was a guy who would find girls who were studying by themselves somewhere in the library, which by the way is like 17 floors tall. I actually have been to the Yale uh, University Library once because one of my family members went to school there, so I, I went to return like 200 books or something this person had checked out. Um, we had to fill like several suitcases, so I have been inside the Yale Library. It's very big. It's like 17 floors tall, so you can imagine that there'd be urban legends about, you know, um, th this one was a guy would uh, find girls um, who were studying in there and he would kiss their feet and run away before they could catch him. So David Class wrote a similar sort of urban legend about a guy who would um, find girls studying in the library and kill them and uh, one of them turned out to be the wife of a professor at Yale who would stop at nothing to unearth the identity of this killer. Night of the Tiger, extremely rare book. I actually have searched for it on Google. I don't think anybody said a word about the book um, except for the occasional person um, listing a used copy for sale. So it's interesting. Um, these uh, these uh, books that are you know heavily marketed by official publishers um, decades ago, today, you cannot even find uh, a word about them on Google. And um, in many cases, that's deserved, but this is one where it is not. So if you can find a copy of that, I recommend it. Um, Honor de Balzac, um, a more classical novelist that I can recommend, um, the great 19th century um, author of the human comedy, a massive collection of texts which um, was actually unfinished before he tragically died of gangrene as a result of scraping his leg on a piece of furniture, a very tragic ending to... Um, one of the uh, greatest writers um, really to ever walk the earth. Uh, his, his life ended far sooner than it should have as a result of a very stupid accident, quite frankly. But the human comedy by Honoré de Balzac is, of course, a response to the divine comedy by Dante. Now, what is the divine comedy except 
a complete picture of hell, purgatory, and heaven. So, in other words, it's a complete picture of the whole supernatural realm. Okay, not just the good part, which is heaven, not just the really bad part, but all of it. And um, even within hell, you don't just see a snippet of it, you see the entirety of hell because he takes you on a tour through all of the different layers of hell and you meet so many interesting characters populating and you get all these details about what sort of sins they had done and what sort of punishments they get as a result. By the way, Dante places usurers lower in hell than murderers, meaning usury is a worse sin than murder. And I do agree with that as somebody who fled the United States as a result of student loans. But at any rate, um, Henri de Balzac, um, created a similarly complete picture of 19th century French society, and he did this not just through showing you the, the wealthy people within Paris, France, or whatever, but, um, you know, rural villages and people of many different backgrounds. You have shopkeepers, you have bankers, you have, um, you know, law students who are trying to work their way up the social ladder uh, by means other than just, you know, studying hard at law school, <laughs> you know, like Eugène de Rastignac in um, Père Goyot. He, uh, he is um, finding a much more effective means of climbing the social ladder than just being a good student, and that's what makes it so interesting. And the criticism of Balzac, um, ironically enough, is that he gives far too many details uh, because the kind of complete picture of French society, which you would have to have in 19th century, in the 19th century, after a sort of industrialized, modernized state uh, that uh, France has fallen into, um, is one in which the the details you get about the the people are precisely their financial details. Um, it's abs absolutely incredible how much attention is given to, especially the question of how much debt each person is in. And if you read um, César Birotto, as I recently did, it's an inc it's it's um to the it, it's incredibly um, detailed in its account of what exactly happens when you fail to pay back a debt. All of the different things that the debt collectors have the right to do to you and the procedure and all of its uh, gory detail is is right there in the page. And um, it's uh, quite fitting that the uh, French film Over the Life of Balzac starring uh, Gérard Depardieu, which is available for free on YouTube, though without any English subtitles. If you speak French, it should be fine to watch it. Uh, it's very entertaining. It's, it's uh, quite fitting that most of that um, a film about the life of Balzac just shows you him running from debt collectors, um, him suffering abuse from his mother, who is uh, bitching about how much money um, he owes to her, how much money she has lent him over the years, and how poor return on investment he has uh, given that, which is ironic because, you know, he's the greatest novelist of the 19th century, but apparently that's still a poor return on investment as far as she's concerned. Um, and of course, uh, it shows him like seducing older women, basically conning them into supporting him financially because he's um, in so much trouble with debt. So um, it's interesting that um, Balzac himself, his own life is kind of, you know, a, a great example of this um, idea that you can only really know somebody, you know, beyond the, the fake um, uh, front that they put up for society. That's a big theme in Balzac is, you know, you have this image you put out there in society, which is a fake. Behind that, the reality view is just how deep in debt you are. And, you know, as um, somebody who also fled the United States, partly as a result of being over my head in debt that could never be paid back, you know, there is some element of truth to that. So I would highly recommend um, Balzac's uh, works, uh, Cousin Bet, um, uh, or Cousin Bet in, in English, I guess is how you pronounce it, and um, The Magic Skin, about a, a magic donkey's skin which can grant wishes but shrinks every time a wish is granted. Um, that is, uh, I think, the breakthrough work for Balzac that launched him into fame. I'd highly recommend that as a very easy and um, quick, not not a short book, by the way, but a quick read. Just as Cousin Bet, I read uh, like 400 pages in one day back in uh, 2009 when I was not even a very fast reader, not a very good reader. I was kind of just starting out as a serious reader. I was still able to read it in just one day because it's that much of a page turner. I'd recommend uh, Perigorio, obviously, as... Um, sort of maybe his best known work, um, though not exactly his best, but certainly his best known. Um, a very underrated work by Balzac, um, which I, I, very few people ever talk about. I kind of just read his happenstance because I noticed out of so many volumes of Balzac when I was in, in um, undergrad, just picked up this particular one at random and read A Woman of 30, um, and it turned out to be one of the more interesting 
you know, novels, which I've ever just happened to stumble across without hearing about it beforehand, okay? And that's because even though the names of the characters are sort of um, the same throughout this novel, it really does seem like um, four different incomplete novels which Balzac was working on, which he just one day strung together and then released as a single book. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's actually incredibly fascinating to read such a strange book, which you can tell is made up of these very disconnected episodes, which he was still brilliant enough to connect in some way. So, A Woman of 30, very obscure work by Balzac, but one I would totally recommend you to check out. Um, and what else by Balzac, as I'm thinking out loud at the moment? Uh, Balzac also wrote, of course, Lost Illusions, which is arguably also his best known work. I actually had to read this in French in its entirety, super long book in uh, graduate school. Okay, so it's one of those books they still teach within college, etc. Um, but, uh, you know, not his best work, honestly, but still pretty good. A guy who leaves uh, rural France, I think he goes to Paris to become a journalist or a writer or something, and he has to basically sell his soul out in the process to do so. Very interesting work, but there's so many um, very obscure texts by Balzac I would also recommend. Another writer I would like to recommend uh, before we wrap this up is Victor Hugo, and particularly the novel um, Hunchback of Notre Dame, although that was not the name of the book in the original French, it was simply named after the cathedral, uh, Notre Dame de Paris. Um, but this is a book which I always have to emphasize for people who maybe only think of that stupid 1990s um, cartoon from Disney, um, that the, the, the book is something completely unrelated to that idiotic cartoon which um, kind of has on the surface level the same characters, but the, the story was so cleaned up for the children because um, the uh, thing about the French um, um, books and especially French films is, as one professor um, of French cinema noted, when he shows a French film to the American audience, they um, scratch their heads and they say, well, where's the rest of the film? I, I didn't see the happy ending, <laughs> you know? And when a, a, when the same film was remade in America, they always change the ending to be, make it happy. If you've seen, uh, I think it's called Wicker Park with um, Diane... Uh, Diane Kruger, the uh, German actress, uh, you know, blonde, um, and uh, uh, Rose Byrne, who is Australian, I believe. Um, I forget the names of the, the, the male actors in that uh, film, which I haven't seen in many years, but uh, that is a remake of um, uh, The Apartment, which is the French title. And it's very interesting how the same film... Um, all of the th things which are too cringeworthy at the level, it's just too painful to watch in the French version, they somehow turn those around and um, while trying to make it as uh, close to the original as possible, they still tweak it just enough to make it happy, you know. Um, and that is um, something which is, I think... Um, bad enough when you're trying to appease adults. I don't even know how much worse it is for children. In a sense, I literally don't know because I have only seen a few minutes of the uh, monstrosity of that 1990s cartoon. But suffice it to say, the um, actual novel, um, Hunchback of Notre Dame, is something which you should approach with no presuppositions, even from the film remakes from, say, like the 1930s, the 1950s. They've all changed it a little bit to try to make it a little happier. It's actually a very dark... Um, uh, novel, uh, but one which um, has so many um, uh, um, amazing um, images and uh, and uh, philosophical speculations and pronouncements by characters and things like that. Uh, the characters themselves, it's, it's a really unique novel, which I almost can't even begin to describe to you, um, except in the negative manner of, say, of saying, whatever you saw in Hollywood renditions of it, just forget about that. The real novel is something very different, and I can only recommend you to read it. This novel, by the way, is the reason why there is such a thing as the Chad Haig channel, uh, because I um, had to... Um, read this when I was in high school. It was part of uh, French level four or something like that. Uh, French was the only subject I was kind of good at when I was in high school, at least for the first few years. So I just kept taking semester after semester, largely because I didn't want to take, you know, the, the more boring quote unquote subjects uh, like, uh, you know, quite frankly, like chemistry was the most boring thing to me when I was in high school. And I didn't even take some of the other scientific classes like geology or whatever. Like it was just way too boring for me, quite frankly. Uh, so I just kept, kept taking French more over and over and uh, when you get the layered levels you have to actually read a full novel in translation of course not in French but you still have to familiarize yourself with French culture so I had to read um, Hunchback of Notre Dame and um, do a, a presentation basically teaching the other students about it and um, 
this actually turned out to be the like the most exciting thing that I did in all of undergrad. As somebody who just a few months earlier was trying to drop out, I um, really read this novel um, as uh, kind of the first novel in years that I had actually really read. Okay. And I had a lot of fun with this presentation. I got pretty good feedback from the students and I decided I was going to be a French teacher after giving that presentation. And of course, that is how I ended up in college a year later. That is how I ended up eventually studying philosophy. That is how I ended up eventually in graduate school starting this channel. So you could see how all of this was connected with the hunchback of Notre Dame. But when I tell that to people, they assume I'm talking about this stupid cartoon from the 90s rather than the much darker, much more sophisticated, but much more philosophically fascinating novel by Victor Hugo, which I have read multiple times, plan to read multiple times again, provided I live long enough to do so, um, and totally recommend for you to check out.